everyone's morning. Great. Uh, there's a couple books I'm going to recommend that you read. Uh, this being one of them, it's The Six Indicators for Business and Life by uh, Kelly uh, Cardenas. He's actually in the beauty space, uh, owns some salons, kind of motivational guy. Uh, this is what he looks, his hair looks like uh, there. Uh, anyway, really uh, uh, been a good read. I've been, I haven't gotten through the whole book yet. One of the things that he said in there uh, that I really liked is in, in, when it comes to creating a culture, in your business, and it doesn't matter if you're a booth renter all by yourself or if you open your own shop, but either you're creating the culture or the culture's creating itself. It's going to happen. And if you want to have a say in how things are going to be, you need to be influencing that. And so as you graduate and leave here, realize that when you're a, uh, if you end up being a booth renter or you end up in a shop someplace, that just sitting back and letting other things dictate how your business is going to be run and the way in which you want things done, you're going to have to influence that. And uh, for some people, that uh, scares them slightly, but that's okay. All right, so last week we talked about there was an assignment. There was an assignment. Assignments were given. So I'll give you a mulligan. Did someone, can someone save the class and, to, and uh, share what the assignment was? And then if you did the assignment, then you have to... Uh, do that part of the assignment too. Wasn't yeah. it turned down to one business card out to a stranger? Okay, so that was part of it, yeah. But it, it, we were talking about scripting and being prepared, right? Oh, yeah. uh, and so you were had a choice of different scenarios in which you were going to write a script. Of this is what I'm going to say. And so if you went and did that, then I'll take that as a as you get an A plus uh, for the assignment. If you didn't do it, then. Uh, then again, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a mulligan, not a pass. You know what a mulligan is? No. It's when you don't accomplish something, and I'm gonna give you another opportunity now to accomplish it. If we go by next week and no one's done it, you all get an F. We put your hours back to zero, and you start over again. Okay. So, uh, did anybody write a script? Okay. I didn't write a script, but I did tell them about it, and I did use kind of a free thought. Like, yeah, yeah. And and it and I'll take that because where I'm saying write it out. It's if, if you can put it in your head and keep it there and have it work, that works, right? It's all about what's going to work. And just because I say to write it out, if you work that way, I, I'll accept that. But the reason that I kind of am uh, emphasizing or suggesting that you write it out is so that you really see it, because that's how I learn. That doesn't mean that's how you learn. But if I can see it, then it helps my brain process it, okay? So uh, where Lily learns by processing in her, in her noggin and then doing it, that, that's, that's the same. So, so Lily saved the class, you won't all get zeros. But the expectation <laughs> this time next week is that you do uh, 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 write or come up with a script. So now to put Lily on the spot, so you were uh, selling product and you sold product. That's a big step, right? What was it that you said that you feel helped sell the product? Yeah. 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 Okay. So it was. If you like this mm -hmm. uh, feeling today, these, this is these are the products I used on you. Uh, I'm I'm assuming during the service. Yeah. Yeah. And and for you to, to experience that, I recommend that you purchase that. Now she buys it, takes that cleanser home, and every time she uses it, what are some of the things going through her head? She'll you think? Remember how she's doing. Yeah. She's yeah. remembering. It's triggering yeah. that remember, experience. Yeah. Okay. When I smell crayons, I remember kindergarten, and I'm almost 49 years old. I mean, that was a long freaking time ago, okay? I mean, we didn't even have the internet yet. So, uh, yeah, life was actually pretty simple, but anyway. So, <clears throat> that, uh, that trigger that's going to be happening is whether she consciously or subconsciously realizes it, she's remembering Lily and that experience, okay? And so that's, that's strong, okay? Um, so, so anyway, if you don't, uh, do it, then uh, uh, we're going to take Trisha's hours since she's graduating today and take them back to zero, and she's going to have to start over. Since she's not here, we'll talk about her. So anyway, um, but today there's I, I'm a big fan of reading books, even though I don't like reading books. Uh, I read books. Why do you think I still read books, even though I don't? 
I, I do enjoy the content that I read and, and that, but like reading is strenuous. Okay, it's easier just to sit and watch TV. Yeah, I, li I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Here's my hack on audiobooks. Within the, the settings, you can speed it up. So you can put a book at two times speed and get through that book in half the time. So that's one of my hacks on audiobooks. Uh, and, and it does take some getting used to. Uh, and, and some uh, of the people that read it, you can't quite put it to two times speed. You can put it at one and a half speed because they read fast. But if you listen to a book, an audio book at regular speed, it's like, come on, get to the point already, let's go. So anyway, at two times speed, you get through the book in half the time, and, uh, and you get the content still. So, uh, But I think reading books, there's, there's great things that come from it. Today we're going to be talking about a book, so you know, usually we are kind of discussing X's and O's of business. Today is more of kind of a philosophy in you creating a culture. Again, one book I highly recommend is The Six Indicators for Business and Life by... Uh, Kelly Cardenas, and this book you'll have to buy online. I, I don't think it's currently picked up. It's brand new. Uh, he signed it and everything because I you order it, and I was one of the first people that ordered it. Uh, he's on social media. I highly recommend following the guy. He's very positive uh, uh, and, and very entertaining, too. So, um, But the book that we're going to talk about that I'm going to highly recommend that you read is a book called Good to Great, and I'm not going to say you're going to love the book. Because uh, I don't, I don't think I love the book, but there's parts of the book that I read, and I and I read this book typically every year. Uh, and and uh, anyway, in that um, we're we're going to be talking about some of the philosophy, not the whole book, but uh, uh, the guy's I think his last name's Collins. Uh, anyway, I, I want to give credit where credit's due. I, I'm not making this stuff up. This is coming from a very good book to read, even though the title is good to great. It's a great book. Uh, and again, I read it every year. Uh, it's not my most favorite book to read, but, but the content in it is very applicable, always very applicable to things that I'm doing and things I'm trying to do. Uh, so anyway, um, this is a quote by Henry Ford. Wealth like happiness is never attained when sought after directly. It comes as a byproduct of providing a useful service. Okay, and, and that's what we provide is a useful service. Um, and, and now it's you uh, putting together your dream. Okay. So in that, uh, have you ever heard me say this? Have you heard me say that? Hopefully you have, because I, I use this in my football. Uh, every single practice, we start with this quote that says, good is the enemy of great. Okay, And, and I, I caution the young men that I'm coaching to not have that just become redundant words that Coach Price says at the beginning of each practice, that they put it into play, that it's not just football, that it's the fact that, that in, in fact, if, it, if they don't take anything but one thing from me as a coach, the one thing I want them to take is that every morning when they wake up, they make their bet. That's it. Okay? Not, not our offensive scheme or our defensive scheme or our special teams uh, drills or anything. The fact that when they wake up in the morning, they make their bet. And, and I go on to say that every uh, uh, high school football team should have one thing in mind. And, and it starts from when they were little it's to play in one game, a game that's going to last three hours. They're going to spend upwards of ten years to get to one game, and that one game is a state playoff game, a state championship game. Okay, uh, and so they are putting all this effort in, and I believe that if you can't make your bed in the morning, that you can't be a state champion, because if you can't do the little things, what makes you think that you can do the great things? But this uh, good is the enemy of great. When I say that, or when you see that, what does that kind of bring to mind for you? Good is good enough. Yeah, anytime you say, yeah, that's good enough, what are you really saying? I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to put forth the effort for it to be great. That's good enough. Okay? And, and so, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't times in life where good is good enough. But when we're talking about relationships, when we're talking about business, when we're talking about our spiritual growth or our or, or physical growth or whatever, good is not good enough. You need to be great. Okay? And so today we're going to talk about these things that matter in pursuing greatness. And we want to specifically target that towards your business. Okay, so there's th these things that we'll discuss will go into any aspect of life. But really, um, this is a, it's a business book. And so as we get to the, to the point here in just a minute, 
It's for your business to be great, there's three things that are going to need to happen. And those three things don't always apply to every aspect of life, not to say that some of them won't, but for, for you to have a great company, there's going to be three things that you need to have as be a part of that and be a part of your culture. So before we get to that, though, um, the whole study of this book initially was to focus, was focused, and it was a group of people that wrote it, even though uh, this guy put his name on it. It was a group of, he had a bunch of people that were helping him in his research. And the research focused on what made a great company. And so they went through and studied a, a lot of companies. When you read the book, you'll see that some of the companies that they that were part of their great companies are no longer in business. So it's to say that, yeah, these are the things that make you great, but if you don't keep doing them, you won't be great anymore and you run the risk of going out of business. And examples are Circuit City, uh, Fannie Mae, uh, and those were things that they said, these are great institutions and, and, and uh, companies and they're no longer around, okay? So, uh, but they did a bunch of research and they said, okay, we want to know what are the things that make companies great. And as they sat down, they just kind of throw, threw out ideas. We think that it's leadership. We think it's employee compensation. We think it's strategy and marketing. We think that it's technology, okay? We think it's all these things. And what, what are your feelings initially when you look at that list? Do you think that these are things that would uh, make companies uh, great? So I'm seeing uh, heads nod yes. What they found were that these things did not play into it at all. That these things actually at times deterred from companies being great. Okay. So, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. When we look at leadership, um, I've talked about this before at one point. Uh, in my professional career, I worked for a cool company called Gateway. Uh, they sold computers. Their computers came in boxes. Anybody remember those boxes? What were those boxes? <coughs> cow. cow boxes. The reason that Gateway shipped their, their computers in cow boxes, cow spotted boxes, was because Ted Waite, the founder, started it in a barn and there were cows in the barn. And that's where they started. Okay? And I love that company. Uh, Ted Waite was just a, a good old boy that figured out how to build cool computers. And along the way, in growing this company, people kept telling him that he needed somebody else to run the company, that he, he wasn't good enough, basically, to run his own company, even though he was, in my opinion, one of the, one of the greatest minds that was ever out there. And he's still out there. I don't know what he's up to. But, but so along the way, Ted decides to... I mean, he's made uh, billions of dollars, and so he decides, okay, I'm going to go be a philanthropist then. I'm going to go do things I want to do. I'm going to turn this company over to someone that went to the right Ivy League schools, to someone that uh, has been running other big companies. And so he, he hired a guy named Jeff Weitzen, Jeff Weitzen and, and you know my feelings on Jeff Weitzen. I do not like Jeff Weitzen. Uh, we shared a bathroom at the same time and peeing in a urinal together. And if I could go back to that moment in time, I would uh, pee all over his shoes. Yeah, I put it out there a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, Jeff Weitzen, a uh, very short period of time, took Gateway and navigated it right into the ground. When I started working at Gateway, the stock was trading at $75 a share. By the time I left, they didn't even allow it on the New York Stock Exchange anymore all because of this guy. And what did he do? Well, he went to the right schools. He'd already been uh, running big companies. He's and not to say he's not super smart, but the things that he did that, that really uh, destroyed Gateway was he bought a bank. Okay, so we're a computer company. Why are we buying a bank? Well, the reason that he bought a bank was because then we could finance computers to people, and he could lower the credit standards of those people to be able to get them loans to buy computers. Okay, what happens when you, credit standards are there for a reason. Why are credit standards there for a reason, do you think? So people can pay back so, loans. So yeah, if you don't pay back loans and your credit history reflects that, then you don't get loans. So he buys a bank in order to lower the credit standard to people that have already proven that they're not gonna pay a loan back. So now they, the bank then gives them the money which they then gives to Gateway and they ship a computer. And it just started a vicious cycle of destroying a bank and destroying Gateway. And I can go into long rants about it, and Jeff Whiteson might disagree, but 
At the end of the day, if he's in front of me, he's getting punched right in the nose because a bunch of cool people uh, lost jobs and a great company is destroyed because of what was considered a, a good choice in leadership. And I'm here to, to publicly and on Facebook Live slander, uh, in my opinion, so I guess it's not slander because I get to say in my opinion and that uh, takes away the slander of it. But, uh, but there are other examples of, of people who were thought to be dynamic leaders that then drove companies into the ground. Okay? If we look at employee compensation, okay? back around 2008, we opened up Austin Kate Academy here next, uh, our, our April, so yeah, next month will be our 10th year in business. Okay? And we're excited about that. Uh, uh, but around that time, when we opened up uh, Austin Kate, the, the economy started to wane a little bit, and then it really hit, hit the fan. Uh, but if we look at that, okay, there was a company, and some of you know my opinion about a company named Goldman Sachs, and again, I get to say my opinion and, and then say whatever I want, because Goldman Sachs does have all the money in the world. They're not going to ever see this probably, but I believe they single-handedly destroyed the world economy. They did, in my opinion. <laughs> so I state it factually, like they did, but then I get to say in my opinion, and then they can't sue me, or they can try, and they do have all the money in the world. So, but their... Their business model was designed around their employees making a lot of money. And so what they were doing was they, they saw, now so it's not all of them, but, but they saw banks lowering credit standards to lend money to people to buy homes. And people were buying multiple homes because of that. Okay, so I remember uh, when we were moving up here, my friend who's a realtor, he's like, hey, I, I found a home. It's a million dollars, and we're going to buy it. It's worth like 1.3, and then we're going to flip it, and, then, and you'll be able to walk away with a bunch of money. And I'm like, there's no bank in the world that's going to lend me a million dollars for a home right now. And his response is, if your credit score is five, six years better, we're in. And I'm like, what? You go, the, the banks not realize that people with a 560 credit score aren't going to be able to pay back a loan or typically have proven that they're not going to? He's like, it doesn't matter. If you got 560 or better, I can get you that loan done. It's like, that's crazy. And, it, and it, it, there was a bunch of things going on. But anyway, what, what Goldman Sachs was doing was buying up all these loans, packaging them in a, in a portfolio, and then selling them as AAA paper, which means these, these loans are the best loans. These people are going to pay these loans back. And that was not the case. And they made billions of billions and billions of dollars during that time. They were fined $400 million for their actions. You know what they did? They just said, all right wrote a check, handed it to the government, and kept on going down, down the road. As it all crashed, anybody in here know somebody that lost a home? It's, it's not all Goldman Sachs' fault that that home was lost because it was the fact that some people got, they, they just felt, oh, the bank's going to lend me the money, then I must be able to afford it. Well, that's not the case. Okay, but there, you know of people that, that lost their home and, uh, uh, and, and a whole market came crashing down, which trickled into all these other aspects and so but employee compensation so they were paying these people millions and millions of dollars to get this stuff done and they were just going out and doing it because they could make money it was all about the money and the repercussions was a global meltdown of, of economics now it it does come back as we can see now the economy is stronger um, I will say that that this is just a side note that doesn't have anything to do with anything has anybody heard of Bitcoin Okay, I don't understand Bitcoin, and I'm not very smart, but when I look at something that really is no tangible deal, but it's like me saying I have this uh, leather wallet is worth $10,000, and, and if you're willing to give me $10,000, it's, it's not. Okay, so, so there, there is some smart people behind this, uh, this encrypted uh, currency, cryptocurrency, and blockchain, and all those type of things. But it's, it's, to me, it's very volatile. It has the ability to go through the roof as just as easy as it has the ability to crash. And this is my caution is that Goldman Sachs is getting involved in cryptocurrency. Even though they're going to say they're not, they are. They're behind the scenes. They're not, they never hold the bag. They're over here doing stuff. And so if the economy is to fail, I believe it's because too many people will dump their money into Bitcoin and Ethereum and different companies that are like that, the cryptocurrencies. And because Goldman Sachs is being compensated for it, I believe that that potentially could be another crash. Now, it would take a lot more money invested into those uh, currencies than what's currently there. But when I, I just kind of always sit back and read articles and look at things, 
And so Goldman Sachs is a company that I really, uh, whatever they're doing that can impact globally, we should definitely uh, be leery of. So anyway, again, it doesn't have much to do with what we're talking about, other than I don't like Jeff Weitz and our Goldman Sachs. So. Um, strategy and marketing. Okay, so you can throw a lot of money in at marketing. You can uh, put things out uh, right now on Facebook and pay for a click, and, and you, there, there's a lot of ways to go spend money, okay? And so people say, oh, we gotta spend money. Well, that, and, I, and I don't disagree. But I also believe that you just gotta get out and do the grassroots things, like talking to people and handing out business cards and things like that. But if we look at Coca-Cola, okay? Back when I was a kid, Coke had this campaign. Anybody that's old like me remember New Coke? You remember that? Okay. So Coke had this campaign, and it's like, you know, we have this formula, and it's been good to us, but it's time to do something different, and we're throwing that formula out, and we're going to do new Coke. Okay, so they spent a lot of money on marketing. Pepsi did something similar with Clear Pepsi. Okay, do you ever do you see Clear Pepsi out there anymore? So it's a cola that was clear. Yeah, I, I don't know that, that it exists or not. But it's just to say that companies can throw a bunch of money at things, and just because... Uh, strategy and marketing may seem solid doesn't mean that it's going to make a, a good company great. There are instances where uh, where a marketing strategy really does blow up and it works well, but it's it's just to say that it's not going to be the deciding factor. Okay, so Coca-Cola then launches New Coke, and then people said this sucks, and they started losing market share. And so in a very short order, they came back with the original formula. And for a long time, a number of years, instead of it saying Coke, it said Coca-Cola Classic. And they had, now they've dropped the classic side of it. But, but for a number of years, it went New Coke. Oh, whoa, no one likes New Coke, so we're going back to the original formula. Maybe that was the strategy altogether, but I will say that there was a lot of money spent to lose money. Okay, and then it went to Coca-Cola Classic, and then... And now we're at a, a time and age where they think you millennials want different flavors. So now they're, they still have Coca-Cola, but they're selling what now? Do you know? Mango Coke. Mango Coke. What? <coughs> what is it called? It, it just has a bunch of different flavors. But they're still keeping Coke. They're just adding to it. I mean, it, so it's like the Italian soda of Coke, but now you can buy it that way. Okay? Uh, and we'll see if it, how that works for them. Um, technology, again, technology is great, it helps us, but if you think that all you're going to do is build something and with, with technology and have it be the end all get out, it, that's not going to necessarily be the case. Uh, even the things that I've done with building a, what I believe to be a very solid app that will help you analyze your business real time, it will send text message reminders to clients. We were the first app ever to have Square inside of the app. So Square said, you guys are the first guys. And we're like, cool. And so we, we're proud of that, okay? Uh, it has online booking. It has all these things, okay? My piece of technology that I believe is very solid will not make you your business great. It'll aid, but you ultimately, the things that we're going to talk about that, that will need to happen for you to be great are all dependent upon you. It's not dependent upon your leadership skills, your employee compensation, strategy and marketing or technology. These things can help, but the great companies all had certain things that were a common theme, and when they hit and focused on those things, then what they found was that they had a great company. And when they deviated, again, because when you read the book, some of the companies that they illustrate as being great companies are no longer in business. So, so what is the three requirements? Are you ready for this? Okay, the first one is, are you deeply passionate about it? So these are the things, to be a good company or to be a profitable company doesn't mean you have to be passionate about it. But to be a great company, there has to be some level of passion involved in what you're doing. Okay, are you passionate about it? And I think that tends to be my student body. By and large, you, a lot of you have thought about working in the beauty space since you were little. Okay, uh, and, and some people, it's... Uh, later in life, they say, you know what, I want to go do that. But there tends to be, not always, but in the high 90%, our student body tends to be passionate about working in the beauty space. 
And I will say that as we watched, because there, there are people that come here to say that and think, oh, this is easy money. I'll just come in and learn eyelash extensions. Sorry, I'm not just going to pick on aesthetics, but, but that's one right now that I have people call me all the time and say, all I want to do is learn eyelash extensions. Why? Because you think it's easy money? Burgundy, is it easy money? Oh, no. No. There's a skill set that's involved, but bur you love it. I love it. So Burgundy loves it. She has a great skill set. She does have employee, or excuse me, employees, clients that are driving long distances because of her passion and because she, they make, she makes them feel good, and, and that works. Okay, so um, we have seen people that just come in and think, oh, this is going to be easy money. I'm going to get a license and get out there, and the passion isn't there. And, and that does impact their longevity and working in this beauty space. So having passion not only is great, but it's also you being, can you see yourself, Burgundy, working in any other industry right now? No. No, okay. And she's doing a great job. Okay, and, and, and uh, you know, a lot of our instructors are. So, but I'm picking on Burgundy today. Nicole's like, pick on me. No, no, don't pick on me. <laughs> so it, it's, are you deeply passionate about it, okay? The, the second one is, can you be the best in the world at it? Wow. That's kind of an arrogant statement, a little bit. I'm the best in the world at it, okay? Now, can we quantify that? And I, and I, and I don't think we can. Can we say that, that Camille does hair better than uh, Burgundy? Uh, and the answer is, uh, I don't think so. Not to say you're not doing great hair. <laughs> It's, but what I'm saying is, your clients, to them, you're the best in the world. When they come to you, and when they drive from Twin Falls to Idaho Falls, uh, two and a half, three hours, to have Burgundy do the, her eyelashes, is there anyone in Twin Falls that could perform that service? Are there people there? Yes, the answer is yes. But because their clients have the experience, Burgundy's the best in the world at it. Okay, and then other Burgundy here is, your clients, it'll be, they're the best, and Camille, to, to her, to, you, to, to your clients, you're the best in the world, okay? And that's what we're striving for. To my client, because it's hard for us to say, this is the best hair cutter, this is the best esthetician, this is the best nail tech, but what we can say is that your clients love you, and to, to them, you're the best in the world. And that's what you're going to need, okay? And then the, uh, the third one is, can you make money at it, okay? So if you can have these three things in any business that you do, you can become a great company. And what's the difference between a good company and a great company? Okay, I, so, so uh, Marcy's saying money, and I'm gonna say, yeah, but I could also, do, I could also uh, argue that money's not, not it. Money's the byproduct of being great, I think. But I think good companies can outperform great companies at times. Okay, not all the time, but I think in short periods of time that they could. Customer okay, service. customer service. Okay, and experience. Right. If if people are passionate about it, and to their clients they're the best in the world, and they can do this for monetary gain and make money at it, then they can have a great company. Now, when you think of great companies. It's not always big companies. Sometimes it's very small companies. I can think of one right now that I'll share, and I've shared before. It's an ice cream company, and I believe the, there's only two locations, one in Portland, Oregon, and one in San Francisco. I've been to both locations, and the experience is the same. They may have more, more uh, locations now, but it's called Salt and Straw. If you're ever in Portland or in San Francisco, I, I say go. Go experience it, okay? You walk in and the, the uh, ice cream flavors are nothing like you'll ever see anywhere else. It's goat cheese vinaigrette pear all in one ice cream and it is the most amazing thing you'll ever have. Uh, yeah, people are going, that sounds gross. Now they do have regular flavored ice creams and those are also very amazing. But uh, when you walk up, you're greeted by somebody, they want you to sample as many flavors as you want to, there's no rush. When, when you walk up with your group, you have someone's, they are there, they're, their attention is devoted to you. They're not on their cell phone. They are, let's try some flavors. They're encouraging you to try every single flavor if you want. And they have a little metal, not plastic, a little metal ornate spoon that they're going to give you the flavor of that ice cream that you choose. And then they're gonna start dishing up ice cream. And at the end of it, 
they're going to pass you off to somebody else that's going to ring you up, and this is what they're going to say. Okay, so if the person uh, up front's name is Barbara, they will say, my friend Barbara now is going to help you. And my friend is something that they always say when they're passing you off or introducing you to another employee. My friend so-and-so is going to do this now. What's the difference between, hey, Barbara's going to help you versus my friend Barbara? It's just a little thing. What, what do you think? You've spent all this time with these people and you're kind of building a relationship, so now they're building a re giving you a relationship with someone else. Yeah, and, and so it is. For them, they want you to have that experience. They want you to buy in. They want you to, and, and you're going to wait an hour in line probably <laughs> to get some ice cream. Just the, the line goes out and around the corner, and it's there all day long. Uh, well, I don't know about all day long, but any time I've gone, it's, it's there, and I've gone at different times of the day. Uh, and anyway, the experience is designed to be different than there, there's a national chain that sells a lot of ice cream. You walk in there, and the person's going to let you scoop, have a little uh, scoop of whatever ice cream you want. The spoon is a little tiny spoon. It's a plastic spoon that gets thrown away. These are ornate spoons that, I mean, they give you a, a fair, fair uh, serving uh, size, uh, probably enough to give you a brain freeze even. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a cool little company uh, called Salt and Straw. Again, highly, highly recommended. Okay? So th this passion for ice cream and pairing things that seem weird it, together is their, is their deal. And it's, it's amazing. It's uh, locally uh, uh, products. It's lavender and honey. It's, I mean, it's all sorts of funky flavors, and again, they still have the, the traditional flavors too, but the experience is head and shoulders above other places' experiences. Now, companies are, I think we're seeing this movement of trying to have this type of thing, this type of experience happen, and, and why, why do you think that is? Why, do, why are companies caring more about creating a client experience? Yeah. Okay, we have options, right? And we also post pictures. And we also interact, want to show everybody all the cool things we're doing on our social media. And I'm all about eating the ice cream. I'm not taking a picture of it and posting it because I'm just about eating the ice cream. So, But a lot of other people are taking pictures of stuff and posting it. And it's all because of the experience. I mean, here we are in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and I'm telling you to go to, to a, uh, uh, a ice cream place that's in... A completely different state, two different states, California and Oregon. Okay, so if you want a great ice cream, get on a plane and go. It's going to cost you a significant amount of money, but it's some of the best ice cream you'll ever have, and the experience is bar none. So, so what is that to you? You know, I, I don't know what you're going to have, and, and I kind of said, and I, I recommend this book here by uh, Kelly Cardenas, that is an amazing. It's been a good read. I'm, I have not gotten all the way through it been a very interesting and fun read uh, but again one of the things he said is you're either building your culture or it's building your it's going to build itself and you're not necessarily going to like what it's going to build if you're not going to take the time to build it yourself even if you are a booth renter there is still a culture that you're going to build between you and your clients okay and it is being passionate about it it is uh, doing a great job on the service so that your clients buy in and think that you're the best and it is charging a fair market uh, value for your services so that you can make a living at it. Okay, so in this, it's easy to kind of say these are three things. Well, okay, well, yeah, I can do those three things. It comes back to discipline. And when we look at, uh, at companies, and we're going to look at one here, if we look at, uh, if, if I can have people buy, believing in the culture and being a part of it, and I have disciplined people, then I by having disciplined people, I can start uh, removing all these rules and laws and, and middle management positions and allow people to thrive. Okay? Uh, here at Austin K, do we have a few rules? Yeah. You want to know what I would love our rule book to state? Show up, look professional, work hard. That's it. Okay? Don't miss school for stupid reasons. Uh, I guess maybe that's another rule, right? But we could get by by don't miss school for stupid reasons, show up, look nice, work hard. That could be our whole rule book. How thick is our rule book? 
I mean, it's a freaking binder. And the reason it's a binder is because every single rule that we have in there is because one of you decided to do something and we had to make a rule for it. So you can thank, in the 10 years that we've been in business, all the other previous students and graduates of Austin Cade for all the stupid, because you, are there times where you're like, this is a stupid rule? I mean, you know, there was a time when you would swipe your card and keep your card, and now you swipe your card and we hold on to it. Because people would swipe their card and then not do their job. So we have to look and say, all right, because student body isn't disciplined enough to do their job at the end of the day, we are going to hold on to their card so they can't log out. And for them to come and get their card, they have to prove that they did their job. Okay, it's creating a whole other level of stuff that we have to manage, which I don't want. I hate the fact that we take your card. Okay? I hate the fact that we take your card. But again, it wasn't just one person. It was multiple people who felt like, I'm not coming to school to learn how to clean. Uh, yeah, you are. You absolutely are. Because to me, it's important, just like in football, that they get up every morning and make their bed. It's important to me that you learn that a clean shop is something that's going to set you apart. Because we can walk out there and I can take you to plenty of dirty shops. Okay? And, and those shops do not thrive in, in this industry. So anyway, I, I'm digressing, but when we're not disciplined, becoming a great company and living your dream of whatever you want to, your dream to be becomes very difficult. Okay? So when we have disciplined people, I don't need hierarchy. Okay? When we have disciplined thought, I don't need bureaucracy. And when we have disciplined action, I don't need excessive controls. Because to me, our rule book should be on a three by five card. Show up, don't miss school for stupid reasons, look nice, work hard. That should be four rules. That should be it. And yeah, we got pages of rules. Pages of rules. And it's and it, guess what? You earn them. And it's not you specifically, it's people that have come before you. And some of it is you specifically. That we have to have that rule there or else you wouldn't do what we want you to do. And what we want you to do is have a great experience, get a great education, learn a craft, understand a little bit of business, and go out and kick, you know what, and take names. That's what I want, okay? Now, I like to pick on Walmart. That's another one of my companies that I like to pick on. And there's a whole story of why I like to pick on Walmart, okay? Anybody ever work for Walmart? Raise your hand. Okay. So, what uh, category or, or where did you work in Walmart? Okay, the photo lab. So this may be a little different. Uh, if you're working in toys, did you ever work in another department besides photo lab? Uh, I ran electronics. Electronics, okay. So when you were in electronics, maybe the photo lab, it would, it would be the same. So you're one of the people putting out stuff on the shelves, right? And, and that's, that's one of the key jobs that you would have. Is that, is that right? Okay. So her job is to keep stuff on the shelves because at Walmart, if stuff's on the shelves, they make money. Okay, that's bottom line. I mean, if, if the guys that are in the back office, it's more like, man, if, if all we do is keep our shelf stock, we make money. Okay, so above you, who's managing you? My former manager, Alan, the manager of the photo lab. Okay, so, and then who manages Alan? Uh, one of the assistant managers. And then who manages the assistant manager? Co-store manager. And then That's store funny. Manager. And then store manager. Okay. So right now we're at five people that are managing someone that ultimately is managing you to put out. Okay. Now there's someone managing those people. It's a district manager who has a certain number of stores. And then there's a regional manager who has a certain number of regions. And then there's a, another manager and then a VP and then a CEO and then a board of directors. All because they want crap on the shelves. That's it. And it's not that they don't have disciplined people because you're freaking awesome, actually, Tana. Don't mm -hmm. say, say, I'm freaking awesome. Yeah. You're freaking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so it's not that you're not capable of putting stuff on the shelf. It's that they have too much theft. They have too much people not doing stuff. And so they just keep putting all these layers. And how much were you getting paid? I was getting paid, what, $8.50, $9 Eight, an hour? 8.50 $9 an hour. And to Walmart's credit, they have, they're increasing stuff. I mean, they're doing some, some good things, and I have reasons why I don't like Walmart. But at the end of the day, they employ, in most states, they employ the most people in, in those states. Uh, not in Idaho, but in most, there's a lot of states where Walmart is the number one employer of that state. 
So, but because of lack of discipline, not just because of, of what you were doing, but because of lack of discipline, and, and I think that they try to, to create discipline, but because of lack of discipline, they have all these layers. There's usually nine layers of people to manage one person that's putting stuff on the shelf that's making just over minimum wage, okay? And, and, it, and it just comes back to your dream, how you have to be disciplined. And if you open a shop, your people have to buy in and they have to be disciplined. And, and these, these things will ultimately allow you to create cool, uh, fun, uh, impactful businesses. Because I believe that's what we do here at Austin Cade and, and we try to inspire, okay? And you guys do a great job with hair show. Let's pick on hair show. Okay, how many of you have been here for a hair show? Raise your hand. And was it fun? Yes. And was it not fun? Yes. yes. And was it stressful? Yes. And at the end of it, how did you feel? Great. Great. And Great. at the end of it, we give a little money. And over 10 years' time, it's been over $60,000 that you as a student body have raised for the Haven Shelter and other charities. And if we look at other things that we've done, I mean, to me, that's cool stuff. When my friend uh, blew his leg off uh, hunting, uh, we did an event that, uh, to help for him, and, and, and we, we just covered a fraction of what the ultimate uh, prosthetic uh, was, but you as a student body got behind it and raised several thousands of dollars that we were then able to donate. And, and I don't do it for praise. I'm doing it because I want you to create cool things and I want you to understand that, that giving back matters and I want you to understand that being profitable matters. And I want you to understand that through doing these things that you can do great things. Okay? But it does come back to being disciplined. It does come back to, uh, to the three things. What are the three things? What three things are going to have to happen for you to have a great company? Come on. Passionate. Be, be the great in the world. Be the best in the world at it. And make money at it. And I believe that every single one of you can do that. I, in fact, I know that because uh, my graduates are out there doing it now. And, and as you do that, then the great things that you're looking to, to accomplish will, will become. But realize that discipline is part of it. It's not showing up late to an appointment. It's not showing up with your hair in a bun and sweatpants. I've seen that. Okay, not so much, well, even in our student body at times. Uh, but, but I've seen that in salons. And that just has no place.